Welcome to the second in our 3D printing for remote control series. In the first video we took a very high level look at the majority of topics that you need to consider when you're looking at 3D printing and in this one we're actually going to build our 3D printer. Now in the first video we saw it sat on the bench in lots of individual bits and pieces and I'm not going to put a build video of the printer together because that information exists already. GE Tech have their own YouTube channel and they also have a very good set of building instructions on their website as well and we'll look at those in a second. But what I will say is that building the printer did take longer than I expected. It probably took the best part of about a day and a half of solid building and that was over three or four days, typically three or four hours at a stretch and then taking a break. The instructions are quite clear and you follow each piece and once you have each piece put together you end up with lots of modules that you then start to bolt together and the 3D printer takes shape. For me it was a cross between building flat pack furniture and putting together a remote control helicopter head. So you do have to be comfortable if you're using a kit building physical things and for those of us in remote control a lot of us has had experience of either building a model first or having to put it back together when we've had one of those hard landings. You also need a little bit of common sense because some of the instructions are Chinese English but we'll talk about that later. For those viewers who are interested in buying a kit and don't want to build the printer and do all the calibration and setup themselves, then you can skip this video and probably skip most of the next one too where we're actually going to look at the calibration process and how you get the software on the printer. And then after that, we'll start looking at the software and getting ready to do our first 3D prints. So the first thing we'll look at is the top tips for building and what we'll do is talk about each of these and these will be relevant for anything you're building, not just 3D printers. So for those of you that have spent many a weekend and evening sat hunched over soldering iron, balsa wood and a set of instructions trying to build an RC model, this will all be very familiar. First of all is when you get your kit, do check the inventory of parts. The parts that come with a kit come in lots of little bags. Each of the bags in mine were numbered and there was a little inventory that came in there too. So I spent a happy 10 minutes uh, with my wife and I kind of tried to find all the bags and she was kind of ticking them off on the list. Do make sure you have everything you need. If you don't, contact the vendor before you get into the build and then find that you're stuck halfway through. Do keep the workspace clean and organized. I completely cleared the entire table and laid everything out. So I had all of the little bags in the top left hand side of the table. I had all of the larger hardware components, extruders, motors, everything else in the top right hand side of the table. And then what I did is every step I got the pieces that I needed, put them all together and then followed the instructions to actually build that piece. Once that component was built, I put it to the right hand side or added it to the printer that was being slowly built at the right hand side. Good way to do that, but to be nice and methodical because when you drop that screw and it bounces around you've got a better chance of finding it. There are lots of extras that I found with this kit so don't worry if you get to the end of building your 3D printer and you have lots of spares. That doesn't mean you've missed a step, it just means that you've got spares in case one of them pings out of your hand and you drop it and it disappears. I would recommend that you print the instructions out. We're going to have a look at the website in a second where those instructions exist, but I would say uh, printing it out is a useful thing to be able to do just to keep track of where you are. I used electronic instructions initially and I found that I was constantly having to fire up the PDF reader and scroll down and trying to find the piece that I was at, where actually with printed instructions, there's a great sense of satisfaction of striking through the piece that you've just built. Test fit everything. There are a couple of places on the model as I've put it together where there was a little bit of slop. The little arms that translate the motion from the stepper motors and the linear carriages on each side of this kind of printer down to the spider in the middle that holds the hot ends that actually warms and prints the plastic did have a little bit of play in the ends. The ball sockets at the ends that they actually connect to, when actually put them on the little rods, they weren't completely snug. And those kind of things you have to be a little careful of. But I'll talk about the things that I found when I put this model together so that you can be aware of them, prepared for them, and take care of them as you come across them. Do contact the vendor or manufacturer if you're not sure on anything. 
I had a problem in mine, again as we'll talk about in a sec, with one of the connectors for one of the fans and a quick email to GE Tech via their website and they gave me a fantastic answer. So before we get into the things that I found with my printer as I was building it, it's good for us to actually tell you a couple of places that you can go to to get the best possible information on how you build this thing. First of all, I'd recommend that you go to getech.com slash wiki slash index.php slash delta underscore rostock underscore mini underscore g2 underscore building underscore instructions. <gasps> Don't worry about that. I'll put that link in the description. But this is by far the best set of instructions that I could find. And thank you to one of my subscribers for pointing me towards this. This has lots of great high color images and it's easy to see exactly what they're talking about. The only thing I will say is the spider, which is the little bit that the hot ends uh, connect to, which is what actually does the printing, was slightly different in these images than the one that came in the kit. I'll take a couple of pictures of the one that I have here, just so if you want to, you can kind of see those images. And hopefully if you get to that point and you're trying to figure that bit out as well, then you'll be able to sort it. Other place that you can go to is GE Tech actually have their own YouTube channel. That's really handy and they do have build videos of their printers. The build videos that they have for the G2S model is the Pro version which is all metal. Of course the one we have here has 3D printed parts but you can get an idea of what they're actually doing and if you're not sure by reading the instructions how to actually do that part of the build in that step, the video is very helpful and kind of gives you a clue. So now we've looked at the instructions, let's talk about how we put this thing together. Just be aware that you'll need some standard kind of remote control tools that you already have. You're going to need some needle files, flat and round. That's just take off excess material. You will need to take off little bits of metal. You will need needle files, both a flat one and a round one. That's to take off little bits of material if it's a metal component to make sure that fit is nice and tight on those pieces that need to be and a nice round one to actually take out some of the excess plastic on those 3D printed parts where something maybe might not fit in properly and we'll talk about that in a sec. You'll need a couple of hex drivers. Uh, I was using a two, two and a half and three millimeter the most regularly. Uh, so Allen keys will be fine. Couple of slots of glues, have some epoxy and some CA glue handy. I'll show you where I've used it on mine. And the last two things, which are absolutely important, you're going to need tons of time and tons of patience. It will take a long time to put this thing together, and I would recommend that once you are starting to get a little bit tired or you're getting frustrated or something isn't making sense, stop, put everything down, go and get yourself a cup of tea, watch some TV, and then come back to it later. Rushing something will cause you problems. For me, I managed to install my bottom plate upside down. Very easy to do but it did mean that I had to then take everything off the bottom plate and refit it just because I hadn't actually looked at the instructions properly enough. So do take your time, double check everything. So the things I found when I was actually building the kit, first of all, is that the instructions use a few different parts. So occasionally you'll find something in the instructions that isn't exactly as you have it in the printer. What I'm going to do is take lots of images of my printer here so that you don't have that problem. If you come across something that you're not sure about, if you look in the description, I've collected all of the images into a zip file. You can download the zip file and have a look at it. It tends to be around the 3D printed parts. It looks like there have been a couple of revisions, particularly of the central spider, which is the bit in the middle that holds all of the hot ends and fan and other bits and pieces as well. So if you're not sure, have a look at those images that I'm going to take of my printer. There are a number of little micro switches that come in the kit that are designed and are there to make sure that as you move pieces around the little switches are activated and they tell the control board when you're at the limits of travel. There's three at the top of the printer and there's one actually on the spider near the hot ends as well and that's used for calibration. In the instructions it talks about mounting them with M3 screws in my case the mounting holes for those switches were actually slightly too small so I needed to get a three millimeter drill on the Dremel and just open those holes up slightly but once I did that they fitted fine. There was some slop in the ball ends of the key carriage linkages. So the linkages that come down from each corner of the printer down into the corners of the spider 
actually had a little bit of slop. The way they work is the ball ends fit on some metal rods and the metal rods were very fractionally too long. So even when I put the screw to retain it at the end of the metal rod, it was moving backwards and forwards on that metal rod about half a millimetre. Now you don't want any slop at all if you can avoid it. You want the only things to be moving on the printer is the stuff that's supposed to be because any slop will translate into badly finished parts. There was a bit of slop in the linear bearings as well. The way it works is the linear bearings are supposed to push into the back of the 3D printed carriages that ride up and down the metal rods in each corner of the printer and you're supposed to hold them on with cable ties. Mine actually fitted really well. There was a lovely positive snap when I pushed the linear bearings into the 3D printed carriage with the exception of two of them one on one carriage and one on the other. So rather than use cable ties, what I did is I actually put a little blob of araldite on each side just to make sure that those bearings were nice and tight and they weren't coming out or moving when the print was happening. I did have to finish a couple of small areas on the 3D printed parts, particularly the places where the metal rods were being pushed in where the ball joints for the linkages connected onto. Those were a little bit tight in a couple of places, so using a round needle file, I just gently took a little bit of material out, eyeballed it each time to see where the encroachment was, and eventually got it to the point where, with some very firm pressure, I could push those metal rods home into the holes that had been printed for them. Do take your time when you're doing that, it's very easy to take too much material, and you don't want to end up then starting to have to glue things in to keep it secure. But just take your time with that and be prepared to kind of sit and work your way through it. And finally, for me, one of the fan connectors was wrong on the control board. The one that came fitted to the cable for the fan and the connector on the control board itself were slightly different versions. I emailed GE Tech and their reply was to use a little servo connector and pop that on. The pitch spacing of the pins on the control board is the same as the servo connectors so that was an easy thing for me to fix and again another reason why being comfortable building and remote control equipment if you can do that building the 3d printer gets a lot easier so in summary I'd say first of all make sure you clean your workspace make sure that you have everything laid out and that you are ready and prepared to build this thing do expect it to take a few days Make sure that you, if you're going to use the dining room table like I did, that you're not going to need it for anything else. Complete each step at a time. The instructions are very clear about making sure that you do each step. It tells you which screws and parts and nuts and bolts you need and get them all together. Complete it, put it together, make sure it's completely happy, test fit everything and then put that element to one side. If something doesn't make sense, use the resources we've looked at. We've got the GE Tech YouTube channel, we've got the getech.com wiki about the building instructions, and there's also the link to the images of my printer here if you're not sure exactly how that piece is going together, particularly around the 3D printed parts. Do approach it like flat pack furniture. It is a very methodical, rigorous process. Test fit everything and make sure that you're putting things on the right way round. And don't expect it to go perfectly first time and use plenty of common sense because of the images and the way this stuff is built and the fact that the pieces can go either way. I would just double check everything. The bottom plate, for example, has a couple of locating holes that are there for the little pieces that become the feet that hold the stepper motors. And I found that those assemblies would fit in one corner and not another. So just by moving them around and trying each of them, I could get them all to fit with a minimum of filing and messing about. So now we've talked about actually building the printer, what we're going to do in the next video in the series, we'll spend a bit of time looking at calibration, but also about getting hold of the software for this printer and getting it on there and making sure that it's ready to go for our first 3D print. Thank you for taking the time to watch that video. There are lots of other videos on the channel and they're carefully ordered into playlists. So you may find that there are other videos on this same subject that you can go and watch. So I would recommend going into the playlist area of Painless360 YouTube channel and looking around and seeing what there is. You never know what you might find. Thanks for watching, please like, subscribe and happy flying.